Good afternoon and welcome to Gender Speaker Live, where today I'm going to be talking about the public sector equality duty. So, the public sector equality duty. Yesterday I was talking about the Equality Act 2010. The public sector equality duty is a part of the Equality Act. It didn't actually come into force until the middle of 2011. And it's probably a piece of legislation that most people don't know anything about. And yet it's probably the most powerful piece of legislation ever put in place. This government don't like it. Well, the Conservative government don't like it. They never liked it. Um, they've never been able to get rid of it. I think partly the coalition sort of blocked it and stopped them from being able to <clears throat> really mess with the Equality Act. And then since 2016, just way too much been going on to be able to try and deal with it. Um, so the best thing was just to not really talk about it, not tell anybody about it at all, and hope that it would all sort of go away. So part of the Equality Act, um, the public sector equality duty is a piece of provision that allows you and me, all of us, to actually hold the government to account. Um, yeah, we can actually challenge them if we feel in some way a policy or the way in which they work is not a good deal for us. If it's not, a, if, if somehow they have set things up so that people with a protected characteristic, and that's all of us because we've all got protected characteristics. We got that yesterday. We've all got age. We've all got you know, a religion or no religion. We've all got a sexual orientation. So if somehow the way a government body or something puts together a policy is unfair for a particular group of people with a protected characteristic, then we can go to um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission or the court and say, hey, hey, this is wrong. The way you're doing this is wrong and we can force them to change it. Now, the reason this government doesn't like is it quite literally, as soon as the you know, 2010 was over and uh, the act came into place, uh, somebody challenged them with actually the previous um, the gender equality duty, which was the predecessor of this, um, because they had done stuff which didn't take account of women particularly well. So anyway, they don't like it because it does mean that you and I, ordinary people, um, don't do what we what's expected. You know, vote, vote them in, then go away for five years and just let them get on with it. Now, this is an interference legislation. We can actually get get in there and get involved. So who does the public sector equality duty apply to uh, in terms of who has to adhere to it? Who has to, uh, who has to be bound by it? Well, simple terms, anyone paid out of the public purse. And that's what this is all about. It's saying if taxpayers' money is being used to deliver some kind of service, then the taxpayer has a right to make sure that that service is delivered fairly to everyone. And if you feel that it's not being delivered fairly to you, you can challenge the delivery of that service, whether that's by the police, the government, the local authority, anything to do with the public sector and more, a lot more than just the the big bodies. So automatically, we've got a public sector body, including the non-government offices. These are the, the, the organizations that are all set up by the government. And of course, there's an awful lot of money being paid out now, particularly from the NHS, to buy in services. So what we'll find is that not just the non-government offices, that's all these commissions and things set up to investigate and look at various things. Anyone delivering service on behalf of a public sector is automatically required to comply with the public sector equality duty. So if somebody is delivering part of the NHS service, a social enterprise has, has been set up to deliver some of the service, GP practice, which is being funded out of the, by, by the NHS, all of them are basically public sector bodies and they have to comply with the public sector equality duty because that's the rule. OK, uh, in addition to that, any organization that is <clears throat> delivering services to the public sector. So I deliver lots of training, transgender awareness training to public sector bodies. So whenever I'm working with the public sector or any organization funded out of the public purse, or whenever I work with anybody who is subject to the to the public sector equality duty, I also then have to 
adhere to the public sector equality duty in what I do. I have to make sure that what I deliver is fair and recognizes people's protected characteristics, that I don't deliver something which is more difficult for somebody else to access. And that's affected me once. I was delivering uh, some training and there was a, uh, somebody who was deaf uh, came to the training and they made it aware in advance that they were coming and I had to then try and find a way to deliver. And it was very difficult because all of a sudden I was finding it my course wasn't going to generate enough income to pay for the cost of having um, a sign, uh, somebody qualified with sign language to be there all day long to sign for this one person who was deaf. Very difficult position. So it's not always a good a good thing. Yeah? Um, at the same time, it's about saying everybody's entitled to fair access to services. So um, where are we going on this from here? Yeah, it also applies to most community and voluntary sector organisations. Now, this is because most community and voluntary sector organisations, I ran a gender shift and organisation that was a social enterprise, but we had chunks of funding that came in from the NHS, chunks of funding from the National Lottery, and all these chunks of money means that it's, yeah, if you're taking that money, you, it's it's controlled by the government. It's controlled in terms of who's allowed to have what. Lots of the money comes from the local authority, from various different government-funded bodies, and therefore most most community and voluntary sector organisations automatically have to comply with the uh, public sector equality duty. So let's have a quick look at a few things here, and we're going to run through some slides and a few bits just to give you some idea about what it's all about and how it all works. Um, I'll see if that works uh, to start with, um, and we'll uh, and we'll go, get going. Right. Um, so let's have a look. Public sector equality duty basically says everybody who is subject to the duty, all those people I've talked about, must pay due regard to the need to. I'm going to come back to that because this is, you know, you kind of wording in legislation is really precise and then tested in court so we know exactly what it means. Okay. Eliminate discrimination, harassment, and victimization, advance equality of opportunity, foster good relations. Those are the three tenets of the public sector duty. You've got to eliminate discrimination, harassment, and victimization, advance equality of opportunity, foster good relations. Now, let me do with this pay due regard. Obviously, it's not going to be possible for anyone to just eliminate discrimination, harassment, and victimization. You can't control that completely. People can still do it. But here's the difference. In the old world, when before the public sector duty, what you had to do was tackle it when it happened. So if somebody discriminates, some, if one of your staff, somebody who worked for a local authority, discriminated against someone or victimized them or harassed someone, or if there was some you know, question of harassment or discrimination, then you go in and say, oh, fine, this is really wrong. We're going to stop this and we'll have a bit of an inquiry and we'll stop it and we'll clean it up and that's fine. What this is saying now is that, no, if harassment, discrimination, victimization takes place, you should have been checking to make sure it didn't happen. So what you've got to do as a public sector body or somebody bound by the Jews, you've got to prove that you paid due regard to the need to eliminate it. You, show, you, you actually did something to try to do something. You did the right kind of training. You actually supervise things properly. You do impact assessments. You've done stuff to try to stop the discrimination taking place. And if you didn't, then you can be held to account for not having done it. And you can have to then sort out your organization and make it all uh, work work better. So this is the whole thing. You're not waiting until it happens and deal with it. You've got to actually take action in advance to try to stop it from happening in the first place. Huge, huge shift of emphasis. Let's have a look at the, uh, the this bit first. Eliminate discrimination, harassment and victimization. Now, these are just my thoughts here, not actually official words from the from the act or from the from the guidelines. But these are the sorts of things that I found over the years of working with this and working with lots of public sector bodies that need to be done. First of all, you need to be getting lots and lots of reporting. So you need to be finding out if you're an organization that's subject to this duty, you need to be making sure 
of how your service is coming across. How well is what you're doing working with the public that you're working with? And that means reporting. It means doing um, uh, focus groups. Uh, it means getting you know surveys completed, getting feedback, not happy sheets at the end of training course. I don't mean that. I mean proper reporting, proper analysis to say, are we delivering a service and are we actually yeah, avoiding? Are, are people feeling discriminated? So you've got to encourage complaints, get people to say, if, if they feel that they're being badly treated, you've got to get that information in so you know what's happening. You can then check it up and do something to stop it from happening. In the first. So you've got to look for discrimination, look for harassment, look for victimization, and then try to stop it from happening. And that means you have to engage much more with service users. You don't just deliver service, you need to build a relationship with them. And everything, every time you create a new policy or a new service or anything that you do, first thing that has to happen, and most public sector bodies know this, but lots of smaller organizations don't, people working with public sector don't realize this, you have to impact assess your service and policy. Have a look at it and think, is there anything about what I'm delivering that means somebody with a protected characteristic is not going to be treated as fairly? And sometimes you actually have to be give a better service to some people in order to make sure that they receive a, you know, a reasonable service. We got some funding for gender shift to, uh, to create a building, and the building was on two floors. Getting up to the first floor was virtually impossible for anybody disabled. So big part of our funding was to make sure we installed in the building a disabled lift so that people could get up and down uh, the stairs. There was no disabled toilet. We had to make sure that one of the toilets became a disabled toilet so that they were able to come to the building, access the services, and then have uh, yeah, proper services while they were there. So these are all the sorts of things that have to now be thought about. Um, <clears throat> and there is lots of examples around of big services. And I'll, I'll give you one example of something that happened to me that I, I hadn't really got um, when I changed from when I changed gender. Um, I changed gender in 2002 and I went to the NHS. I went to my doctors and I was now needing support and service from them to check with all, you know, uh, the hormones and things that I was taking. And so I registered as female. That's all you have to do is go in there and say, I'm now f female. Um, and that means then that they treat me uh, differently. Well, within two weeks, I got an invitation for a breast screening. I didn't actually have any breasts at the time. I was still still working on that. But <clears throat> I was quite surprised. I thought, oh, my goodness, that was very quick. Because all of that time up until 52, registered as a male, I had never once been asked about screening for prostate cancer. Not once. And yet the incidence of prostate cancer in men is pretty much the same as the incidence of prostate cancer in women. There's virtually no difference in the death rates. And the amount, of, amount that's happening. And yet when you look at the amount of money spent on prostate cancer compared to the amount of money spent on you know trying to tackle breast cancer, it's totally disproportionate. Now, it's got a lot better now over the past 20 years as a result directly of the gender equality duty and then the public sector equality duty. The NHS has had to look at services like this and change it around, shift it so that they actually do provide equal levels of service. They were not taking account of men specifically, uh, and therefore, as because sex is a protected characteristic, they were not, men were not being given the level of service that was being given to women, and that had to be changed. There are all sorts of other things the other way around. Um, and I'm sure you say, oh, yeah, this, if there's places where it's unequal, this is where the, uh, the duty is there to help you to challenge it. So advance equality of opportunity. Now, this was an interesting one because what I found, I went to a meeting one day and um, I looked around the room and this was a meeting being run by the local authority. And it was mostly to do with the community and voluntary sector engaging with the public sector. So we had lots of people from various different parts of the local authority and lots of small um, charities and social enterprises there represented. I looked around the room, I thought, ah, oh, or white meeting, not one single person from the BAME community. So I put my hand up. I said, "Excuse me, what? Why is there nobody from the BAME community here?" Oh, we asked them, but nobody came. They said, <laughs> "Lack of understanding of the public sector equality duty." Immediately there, 
because you can't just do that. If people haven't turned up from you know, other you know, vulnerable communities, people with a protected characteristic, race, religion, or whatever, if those people haven't turned up, if there are organizations not represented at a public meeting that really should be there because the Bennett, you know, then you have to question why. Why didn't they get there? Was it because transport was difficult for that particular group? Is it because they've come from a country where dealing with the local authority is very dangerous? People kill you. Um, is it because they, they don't have adequate, you know, uh, Speak, uh, don't speak the language adequately. Um, <clears throat> there's a whole range of things, but what we're saying is these are people legally, legitimately in this country able to live here. I'm not going to get into the arguments about <clears throat> immigration, but if they're here, legitimately here, they're legitimately entitled to access to services. That's the way it works. And if they're not, because somehow it is more difficult for them to access service, then you have to explore that and think, right, is there a better way? Now, I'll give you another example of this. Local authority, um, I was talking to somebody from a social enterprise, he said, this is what happened. Local authority, we're talking to them, and said, we just can't seem to access young people. We said, well, have you tried? So, well, we do invite them, and they don't come to the meetings. Well, come on. Inviting young people into a stuffy meeting that sounds very, very political. He said, what do you want to do? He said, we want to do some research. We want to actually ask young people what they need, what, the, what their needs are, but they won't come to the consultations. He said, you come, I'll give you the date. You come with your team to take the, to do the consultation. I'll get you in front of young people. They arrived and there is a thousand of them. Why? They ran a music event. Young people came to the music event. That was something that interested them. While they were there, they were happy to do the consultation. But just inviting them to, do you see what I mean? You meet differing needs. That's another part of the whole process. Thinking about that, I've had, you know, I've helped with all sorts of research to do with trans people. Very hard to get older trans people to go to meetings, health problems, absolute fear, terror of what was going to happen because they've lived through a life when being trans has been a really something they kept secret, something they kept quiet. And yet these were older people not getting access to the services that should be they should be entitled to because of fear. And by getting them into a consultation, coming to our place, which was a safe space, bringing the researchers to us, we were able to actually find out about what was going on and start to help improving services. And the final thing is encouraging participation in public life. This is one of my big bugbears because they all talk about democracy. Yeah, yeah, it's all about democracy. Everybody votes. The problem is if you've got a huge white majority in a country and then you have an election, you've got to stand up some people for election. The, the challenge is that invariably the white people will vote for the older white people, which is what they do. So you've got to find different ways sometimes and think about different ways about getting people into positions on NHS boards, on local authority boards, on local uh, council, uh, uh, you know, the community, uh, various different community groups um, that, that exist. Sometimes you have to appoint in order to make sure you've got the right kind of representation. But most importantly, you've got to tell people that you want them there. And I was quite surprised to suddenly discover I was at a Manchester uh, at the Pride one day and talking there, and I walked up to something and somebody said, oh, would you like to come and join the police force? <laughs> I said, I don't think you're going to want a, a very old trans woman there. Oh, yes, we do. They said, we need to understand the needs of the transgender community. Otherwise, we cannot Put effective policing in place. If you don't tell us what's there and we therefore need people within the police force who can access those communities and get us the information to know how we police where I thought, well, well there. Who'd have thought that? Impact of public sector equality duty. Encourage participation in public life, meet different needs, remove and minimize disadvantages. And finally, Foster good relations. This is between different groups. You see, just because someone's got a protected characteristic doesn't mean everybody with protected characteristics is going to be friends. Because, you know, there, there are people with religious beliefs who think that trans people and gay people shouldn't be around. And there is all sorts of shows. And there's you know, conflict between the different types of religious groups who all claim access to the one God. Yeah, it's uh, <coughs> prejudice 
one group against another. And sadly, since 2016, we have seen an enormous amount of increase in the amount of prejudice with extreme right, extreme left activism going on. We've got you know, kids being arrested for being part of the uh, um, environmental campaign, Extinction Rebellion. Um, and I'm still hearing all sorts of stuff because obviously the Brexit uh, issue is now back on the table because we're getting close to the end of December. Um, so prejudice is is often stirred up by politics. But the whole point about the Equality Act is about creating fairness and diversity. It's actually it's run and driven by a human rights agenda. And you have to tackle prejudice. And that means people within organisations who are subject to the public sector and college duty must look at prejudice within their organisation and tackle it. Proper training, promote understanding, help people understand what's going on. And a whole variety of different ways in which you can do that. I know somebody who, in order to help tackle prejudice in a care home, as a public care home, uh, they had all sorts of problems going on with staff really not dealing with things. And they said, right, this is what's going to happen. Half the staff will spend the morning in a wheelchair and the other half will spend the afternoon in a wheelchair. And I want you to understand, this, said this friend of mine, just what it's like and how you're being treated when you're in a wheelchair and you can't move. Totally changed attitudes, helped promote understanding within the staff because they weren't getting how talked down to the patients were feeling. It's all about creating fairness, creating good community, creating an environment and fostering an environment where people want to be there. And that's surely what we want, isn't it? We all want to be able to access services and feel as if we're welcome. Certainly, that's me as a trans person. That's what I'm looking for. So here's a few things just in terms of prevention of some of the problems, uh, including lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and other gender variant people in marketing training materials. So if you're an organization um, that's you know working uh, and you're subject to the public, even if you're not, come on, public sector ideology, uh, quality is actually good practice. So if you have to comply with it for part of your work, you might as well do it for everything. And that's the big, huge corporates that are building hospitals and building, you know, delivering services into government. Yet yeah, you've got to comply with the public sector of duty for those. So why not comply for everything? Just make it part of your corporate practice. Include, OK, my focus is LGBT. So <clears throat> include us in your market. Make it look like we're part of the scene. Involve all staff in E&D initiatives. So make sure everybody gets involved in equality and diversity initiatives. Specific educations on issues regarding homophobia and transphobia. Okay, it's you know, We've talked about this week, I've talked about unconscious bias and hidden prejudice, talked yesterday about the Equality Act and the issues around discrimination and indirect discrimination, associate, etc. And today we're talking about the same sort of thing. It's how do we stop discrimination, harassment, and victimization. Policies and staff meetings to address LGBT issues. Bring it up. Make it a part of the thing. If you've got newsletters that go around your organization, include things to do with various different characteristics, yeah, protected characteristics. Make sure you've got champions and representatives to get these topics and issues being talked about. Posters and displays up to help people understand and support in my case, LGBTQ events, but support events that relate to protected characteristics. Become a patron to different events. You know, get involved in the Pride events. Oh, God, I hope they're back next year. But no, we, we've really missed them this year. But hopefully next year we'll see, we'll see more. But can you see this is all about involvement? It's all about getting involved uh, and making the whole thing work. So um, that's... Um, that's up for now. Let's get back to me. So that's my screen share over. Um, the people who control and manage and who you report to is the Equality and Human Rights Commission. They lost most of their funding pretty much after the uh, straight after the uh, <coughs> um, 2010 election. They've struggled to fight, but they're still the people there. They're still around and they're still the ones that you can uh, tackle issues that are going on. Tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about inclusion and belonging and it's really the follow-on from what we've been here all the unconscious bias and all the equality act and public duty leads us to a point where we're saying let's create 
an inclusive environment where everybody feels as if they belong. How do we do that? Tomorrow, 4 p.m., I should be talking about that, and I hope that uh, you'll join me then. For now, thank you for being with me, and uh, see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.